particular case has started in 2007. Uh, there were three um, individual applicants, um, Terry Jean Bedford, Amy Leibovich, and Valerie Scott, who uh, are three sex workers. You know, some, at this point, you read that some of them are former sex workers and would return uh, in various ways to the profession if the laws were um, more favorable. Uh, and so what they did is they um, started a charter challenge, which is saying that um, because it's, yeah, we can go to jail for communicating about sex work, we can go to jail for practicing, uh, for doing sex work in an indoor location, it's all kind of vague, but in an indoor location on a regular basis, and um, that people that we work with, third parties, or people call the pimping law, can also be uh, criminalized, that these three things make our work, um, their main argument was make our work unsafe, and put us at risk, and um, you know limit our security, our right to security of the person. So um, in 2009, they got a great decision from the first level of court in, uh, in Ontario, saying that you're right, all of these three laws um, really, and the decision is mostly focused on it, really makes things unsafe. So then the Court of Appeal, five different judges um, uh, said, you know, they sort of split and they said that um, we should allow people to work indoors because that's safe, get people off the street, uh, blah, 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 but you know, really working from the street or soliciting from the street is still, uh, still should be criminalized because it's totally valid to um, put people in jail on that and, you know, regardless of their situation and regardless of, you know, we can just basically, the message was everyone go inside and then it'll be better and, and that's fine. Um, so then that got challenged again. So both sides at that point, so it's, the sides are the three applicants, the three women, um, and the government of Ontario and the government of Canada, basically. So both sides at that point were like, we don't like your decision. The government of Canada and the government of Ontario said, we don't like the fact that you let, now you're saying that people can work inside. And the sex workers were saying, we don't like the fact that you say we still can't work outside or we still can't solicit on a street, uh, on a street basis. Um, so this brings us this week to the Supreme Court, which is um, sort of the end of the line. Like whatever happens this week is what the law is. Our lives are at stake. Uh, and this goes way, way, way beyond concerns around community nuisance complaints. Um, I'm sorry, but my life is so much more important than your disgust over a condom on the street. And the laws need to change because, like I said, lives. This is super important. People are dying because of these laws. Um, so sex workers are one of the most maligned and misunderstood groups of people in history. We're stereotyped unfairly and wrongly as vectors of disease, as drug addicts, as victims of child abuse, all the way right down to the myth that all sex workers are women, which is patently false. Uh, with criminalization hanging over our heads, we're stigmatized as criminals as well. When we're as cri understood as criminals, this becomes our master status. That is, the notion that we're criminals informs our entire being, uh, as if we're, we're the only facet of our identity. Our status as mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, husbands, wives, students, teachers, members of the community, is all our, our status as basic human beings is all invisibilized in favor of our criminal identity. Um, and our work is just that, it's work. Uh, we should not be forced to work in silence and isolation out of fear that we'll be outed to our families and disowned, or outed to our landlords and evicted, or worry that we will be dismissed as whores if we try to go to the police and uh, report violence. We should not have to worry that our children could be taken away simply because we're sex workers. We should not be forced to justify our decision to do this work, or be forced to tell our tragedies to access services. I shouldn't have to worry that my partner could be arrested for living off the avails because we share an apartment. Um, the assumptions that are made about sex workers and our work are incredibly damaging, um, incredibly, incredibly damaging. Uh, and if any of us suffer from low self-esteem, as the rad femmes claim that we must, it's because we have internalized the rampant whorephobia in our culture that tells us that we're worthless. Um, the criminalization of our work, combined with societal prejudices that we are not worth caring about, leaves many of us vulnerable to community and police violence. Uh, I'm not a sex worker. I've had family members in my family and friends that were sex workers. I lived out in Edmonton for 12 years, and um, in, that light, in that time that I was there, I experienced tremendous violence and seen a lot of violence happening to Indigenous women. And one thing I knew for sure that you were more, you were more likely to be assaulted or um, have problems with the police than 
to be protected by the police out there. The myth out there that sex workers, that um, indigenous sex workers are responsible for missing and murdered women is completely wrong. The way that this, the way that colonial policy is structured is the problem. The racism and hatred towards indigenous people is the problem right now. And the way that the media constructs, constructs indigenous people in a negative way is the problem. When my sister was murdered in 1990, they, they immediately focused on the fact that she was in a park downtown. That somehow it was her fault that she got killed. You know, it's victim blaming, it's victim shaming, it's like, it's derogatory and it's gross. Um, and as a 16 year old, for me to see my sister's dead body on the front page of a newspaper constructed as somebody who deserved to die because she was had dark skin and she was in a downtown park known for drug dealing and prostitution was completely wrong and it's still happening today. The other thing I wanted to say was, you know, what the media didn't focus on was that she was a mother, that she was married, she had two children, you know, that the, the things that led her to those situations were, was colonial policy that was forced upon her as a child. For so long, already Indigenous people have had decisions made for them, what's best for them, for decades. And, and it's got to stop. We need to have our input into it too. And what's really important today about sex work is the fact that Indigenous women need their own, need to make their own decision about how they come to sex work. If they, they, they can decide for themselves what's best for them. And, um, and if you have a system in place like right now where it's criminalized and Indigenous women are afraid of the police, that's pretty bad. You know, I didn't even have to read the Human Rights Watch that was released recently about um, all the women that were impacted by the RCMP and the police who assaulted them. I didn't even have to read it because I knew already. But these are our lived experiences that um, we're saying your system is corrupt, it's not working, and, and it's, it's making things worse for us. It's harming our lives, and um, it needs to stop. So I fully support decriminalizing sex work, and I fully support. Um, My mother was a sex worker, and um, just the uh, stigma that she faced, especially the time she was doing it, you know, it was in the 70s and 80s, it was just basically abused from, you know, the government, from the police, from even, you know, the agencies that were supposed to help her, and it was really hard for her to, you know, uh, get anywhere. There's a lot of similarities between people that use drugs and people that are involved in sex work and that's I guess the oppression by society and police is putting us into dangerous situations as was touched upon earlier um, not allowing the people to talk you know pushing them into dark alleys and not having safe places for them to do what they do is you know allowing people to be murdered and beat up by police and raped by police uh, a lot of the girls I talked to have been raped by police officers several times and there's really not much they can do about it um, we need safe spaces, you know. Uh, there's no way that prohibition has ever, you know, helped anything in the society. We've been trying to get rid of both sex work and drug use for centuries, and it's not working. And we need to look at responsible and, I guess, healthy ways to help the, the people who are most affected. And I don't think that's been the case yet. And uh, I just, I guess, I'd like to end it by saying I'm sick and tired of having my friends pushed in the dark corner so they can be murdered and disappeared. Um, in the end, it was found by, uh, what was it, Jill? Uh, at the hydroelectric on, uh, like, off the <coughs> board, yeah. close to the Champagne. She was a fixture in my community. And, uh, like you said, you know, just the way the paper talked about her, you know, she was a drug user and a sex worker. Talks like, away like trash. Yeah, like she's a disposable human being. And I'm just sick and tired of, you know, these people being treated as they're disposable. They're as valuable as any other member of society. And, uh, I just think. We have to work in solidarity, and uh, it's really inspiring to see everybody here.